The time for the Hajj had come. Pilgrims from all over the Muslim lands had descended upon the holy city of Mecca. All sorts of people had come to visit the house of Allah. And as they were there, all of them clad in white, equal before Allah, equal between themselves, they heard the shocking news that the very grandson of the Holy Prophet وسلم, was not able to complete the Hajj. And so while he prepares to, to, to leave, he gathers the people and he gives a sermon. And he clarifies in the sermon what is going to happen. And he, in that sermon, he also says that you, sh you should notice that the rules of Islam are being violated, that innovations are being carried out, and the original message of my grandfather, the Prophet, is tarnished. It's no longer pure and pristine the way it was. Finally, Muhammad ibn Hanafi, who comes down from Medina after al Hussein, he says, please, I beg you, do not leave. And the Imam says, it is not for me anymore, the decision. It has been decided. People are asking me to leave, I must leave. People are asking me to join them, I must go to them. Muslim has responded, I must come out. So my obligation now is not in keeping myself safe, my obligation is to respond to these people. If they do not give their oath of allegiance to me, you see, then do what? Cut off their head and send it to me in Damascus. Written in blood. Hussein bears witness that there is no Lord except Allah. He is one, he has no part. Conserved by faith. I have kept one for your father, Al Hussein, where he's much, much more thirsty than you. Engraved in hearts. Yazid is evil, and I am good. Yazid is battle, and I am haq. The only way you'll see this is if I am killed in the desert, and I'm willing to go through this. An undying flame. The story, the story of Hussein. Hussein. Peace be upon him. The journey of Al-Hussein to Karbala, I think, represents uh, several messages and meanings. The way that Al-Hussein, at every stopping point, was questioned and asked, where are you going? What are you doing? What is your aim? Why will you not turn back? The people are against you. Surely you will face death. And at every juncture, Al-Hussein was saying to the people why he is going to Karbala, why he's going towards the people of Kufa. It was not just mere um, rest places where the Imam would command his followers to establish the tents or to stop for a while. It was indeed to gather support A and B to mobilize as much uh, movement against the rulership and the governorship of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and Bani Umayyah as possible. Everyone in Mecca was grieved to see him leave. When they persisted in their attempts to dissuade him from leaving, he quoted poetic verses composed by a poet from the Aws tribe who had been warned by one of his cousins against participating in the jihad in support of the Messenger of Allah. I shall proceed, for there is no shame, in death to a man who set his mind, to follow the truth and to perform jihad as a Muslim. He consoled the righteous man in person, leaving behind the depraved, opposing the criminals. On the journey from Mecca to Iraq, Imam Hussein and his companions stopped at a lot of places. These were quite normal places where people would stop on the journey. Some of these places had water so they could refill their supplies in the middle of the desert. Others were mountains or other good places to rest. The first station that Imam Hussein stopped at 
when he left the city of Mecca is an area known as Tan'im. Today, it is known as one of the Mawaqeet, the designated places by which the status of Ihram is uh, commenced or initiated. This area of Tan'im is where the Imam Salamullahi Alayhi sees the caravan that was heading towards Sham in order to supply Yazid ibn Mu'awiyah with certain goods. The Imam decreed that this was unlawful property being carried to Yazid, so he did not allow them to continue. He was, after all, the Imam. This was his role to see these things. But he offered the desert Arabs who were with the caravan, he offered them a choice. He did not apprehend them. And he said, either you may accompany us and we will pay you for your services, or else you are free to go and we will pay you for as far as you've traveled with this merchandise. And so some of the desert Arabs who were with the caravan joined Imam Hussein alayhi salam and others went away. But in either case, they were very grateful for they were very impoverished and Imam Hussein alayhi salam paid both sides of them generously. And then Imam Hussein salam distributed the, the wealth after Tan'im, between Tan'im and Al-Sifa, he met some Bedouins who complained to him about the terror of Banu Umayya. And he promptly distributed the wealth that he had taken from the governor of Yemen, Yazid's governor in Yemen, and gave it to the people, distributed that. In an area known as Sifa, Imam alayhi salam meets the famous poet known as Al-Farazdaq ibn Ghalib. At that juncture, Imam Salamullah alayhi wants to ascertain, although he knows and he is fully aware of the situation in Kufa, yet this is for history to record and for people around him to recognize and understand. And hence he would ask the poet, what is the state and how have you left the people in Kufa? At al -Sifa, Al Hussein met Al Farazdaq ibn Ghalib, the poet, so he asked him about the people whom he had left behind. Al Farazdaq said, Their hearts are with you. The swords are with Banu Umayya, and destiny descends from the heavens. Imam Hussein Salam says to uh, Farazdaq, so What is your preoccupation? And he said, I'm a poet. And so Imam says that your name is a very short name for a poet. At which point Farazdaq says, Yabn Rasulullah, your name is also very short for somebody who is the son of the daughter of Rasulullah. And at which point he, they, depart, he parted, they, depart, they parted their ways. Imam Hussain continued towards uh, Iraq and Farazdaq went towards Hajaz. On the 15th of the month of Dhul Hijjah, Imam Hussain alayhi salam and his companions arrived in a place called Al Hajir min Batn al Ramma. This place was a crossroads. From here, you could decide to go either to Kufa or to Basra, and conversely, people would meet coming from either Basra or Kufa on their way to the Hijaz. Imam alayhi salam sends another letter to the people of Kufa in response to the communication he received from Muslim ibn Aqil, his ambassador to that city. Having reached al Hajjah from the direction of Al-Rumma, he sent the people of Kufa the answer to the letter which he received from Muslim ibn Aqil and dispatched it with Qais ibn Musahar. In it, he said, Muslim ibn Aqil's letter reached me. In it, he informs me of your consensus to support us and to demand our rights. Therefore, I plead to Allah to enable us to do what is good and to reward you with the greatest of his rewards. I have come to you from Mecca on the 8th of Thul Hajjah, so if my messenger reaches you, maintain your stand for I shall reach you in a few days. The man had arrived and he was caught. He had a letter from the Imam to Muslim. So when he was arrested, immediately he took out the letter and ripped it to pieces so it would not be read. He was taken to Ibn Ziyad and Ibn Ziyad says to him, you will tell me what is in the letter. He said, no. Ibn Ziyad said, why did you tear up that letter? Qais said, so you would not know what it says. Ibn Ziyad demanded, who was that letter sent to and who were you carrying it for? Qais said, the letter was from al Hussein for the people of Kufa, but as for which people of Kufa, I can no longer find out. 
because the letter was torn. He said, surely I will have you killed. You must ascend the pulpit and curse al Hussein." So the man was forcibly taken to the Grand Mosque of Kufa. People arrived in their thousands. He ascended the pulpit. He praised Allah. He praised the Prophet. He praised al Hussein and his family and his mission. And he cursed Ibn Ziyad and cursed Yazid and cursed Muawiyah. And he said to the people, Hussein is camped at so-and-so place. Go out and fight for him. Go out and defend him. He said that he was thrown from the top of the, uh, the pulpit and, and fell and his bones were crushed and he was killed eventually. The point was, this man till the end was a believer in the mission of Imam al Hussein. And these were very few. When Imam received the news of his death, he was very much upset. Imam Hussein salam, and his companions traveled on. It was now the 18th of the month of Dhul Hijjah, the day which for many people is a day of happiness and a day of celebration. Eid al-Ghadir, but for these people it would not be a time of celebration. They stopped at a place called al khuzaymiyah They stayed there for one day and one night. In the middle of the night, Hazrat Zainab, peace be upon her, heard a strange, otherworldly voice calling outside. In the morning, she went to see Imam Hussain salam, and she said, My brother, last night I went outside of our tent in the middle of the night, and I heard this mysterious voice calling. And she began to weep at that lament. And Imam Hussain reminded her that you know, death has been ordained for everyone, and that he had to deliver the promise that he had made to his grandfather to uphold the, the message of Islam, which is the message of truth and justice. Uh, at which point, obviously, she calmed down, but she was deeply pained because now she was absolutely sure that death, was, death of her brother was inevitable uh, because the news had been coming in, in bits and pieces about what was happening in, in Kufa. The Imam reached a, a small area called Zarud, and there, by coincidence, uh, was also camped Zuhair ibn al-Qayn who was one of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, but he'd had some differences after the uh, abdication of Al-Hasan salam He had some differences and was not on good terms with the Imam. And so what brought them together was this camping at this place called Zarud, where water was available. And so purely by coincidence, the two arrived at the same time and were camped at the same time. And the narrations mention that he was inside his tent having some food with his wife when the messenger of Imam al Hussein said to him from outside that I am coming to you from the grandson of Rasulullah and he wishes to see you. Zuhair ibn al Qayn ponders, reflects, narrations say puts his head down in deep thought. His wife said to him, what are you waiting for? The grandson of Rasulullah has called you and you're hesitating? Go to see what he wants from you. And so Zahir decided to follow his wife's advice. And so he went over to the camp of Imam Hussein. Salam. No one knows exactly what was said between Imam Hussein and Zahir. All we know is that when he came back, he was a changed man. His face was shining with joy. He was excited. He called his wife. He said, my wife. You are divorced, you are divorced, you are divorced. She said, what? I'm divorced? And he said, my wife, I don't want you to be harmed at all because of me. I have decided to follow al Hussein ibn Ali. I am going to support him and I am going to defend him even if I have to give my life. She said, what has happened to you? A minute ago you were unwilling to meet al Hussein, and now you're telling me to leave and, and you're facing it. What has happened? He said, surely al Hussein told me about his destiny, about what is to happen to him. I must be with him on this journey. He knows where he is going. And I was reminded of something Salman al-Farisi, Salman al-Muhammadi had told me many, many years ago when we had invaded uh, an area and we'd conquered some land and taken some wealth and I was happy with what we'd done. And he said there will be a day when the grandson of the Prophet wants you to join him. Be happy on that day that you will join him. And he said to his wife, now I'm being reminded of my, my destiny as well. I will go with Al-Hussein, I will die with Al-Hussein. So you go back, and his wife refused. She said, no, I will remain with you. 
If Al Hussein's women are going, his wives and his daughters are with him and his sisters, then I will be with you as well. I will suffer as they suffer. Which is a, the stance of a noble woman, someone who understood what was to become. At the same time in Zarud, Imam Al Hussein was informed of the sad news of the martyrdom of Muslim ibn Aqil. He performed the istirja, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, many times. He wept and cried. The women all cried and wept over the loss of this great man. And it was there that he famously said, لا خير في العيش بعد هؤلاء. There is no worth living after knowing that these individuals have indeed passed away. The Imam now had to give the news to the rest of his companions. They were not riding to victory. There was no one left who would help them or support them. He stopped and he addressed his companions and he told them, the news has reached us that Muslim ibn Aqil and Hani ibn Urwa have been martyred. Our Shia in Kufa have abandoned us and we have no helper and no supporter. If any of you want to turn around now and to go home, you will not be blamed. Many of those who were riding with Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they had thought that they were riding to victory. They thought that Imam Hussein alayhi salam would soon rise to power and they were going to gain money or prestige or status or position. When they realized that this was not the case, they left and only those who were truly there to support Imam Hussein and to support his mission remained. So that those who were traveling with him, if they were unprepared for this, had a chance to leave. And those who were to read history later on would see that the Imam not only is going to death, but is going to a, a terrible uh, situation after his death. He knows what will happen to his body, what will happen to his family. The next stop that the family of Al Hussein arrived at was uh, in the lands called Al Aqaba, which isn't one place in particular, but it is, you know, diversified lands, all generally called Al Aqaba, and the Imam was camped there. And he had a vision. In the vision, he saw himself being torn apart by fierce dogs. He told this vision to his companions, and some of them said, maybe we should turn back. You've heard now what's happened in Kufa. I don't think that we should go there. I saw myself being mauled by dogs, which means to say that not only will I be killed, but I will be desecrated, my body will be desecrated in such a way that nobody has ever seen a death like this. So informing the people that he's not going just to be executed, for example, uh, in a manner that many people who were the enemies of the Khulafa, Ben Umayyad, Ben Abbas suffered, but in a way that was going to leave a mark throughout history. Imam Hussein السلام, and his family, his companions, those who were left with him, they continued on until they stopped at a place called Sharaf. It was early in the morning, before dawn, and he ordered everyone to take as much water as they could, as if he had a premonition that they would be needing that water later that day. They continued moving through the desert. It was very hot. The sun was beating down. When all of a sudden, one of the companions of Imam Hussein shouted out, Allahu Akbar! And the Imam says to him, why have you, uh, why did you do takbir? He said, I saw palm trees. The Imam knew that this was perhaps, you know, a, a mirage or so on. A, des a palm tree in the middle of the desert is unlikely. So he said to his men to gather around. And within a short amount of time, it seemed as if these palm trees were moving in. And they said, maybe what you are really seeing is horses' ears and the tips of spears. The Imam said, I am also of this opinion. And they went behind one of the hills to take shelter. The objective of Hur and his small army was to stop Imam 
where he was, not allow him or give him an opportunity to return back to Medina, nor give him the green light to advance towards Kufa. When they had reached this area, we are told that Al-Hur and his army were suffering with thirst. The first thing he said was, we are very thirsty, do you have any water? And this is the enemy or the prospective enemy that Imam Hussein is meeting. And he immediately instructs his people to open the skin water skin bags and give them water. Water was given to all the soldiers and the, the cavalry and the horses. This is the first thing that surprises Al-Hur to see that even though this man was supposed to be his enemy, look at the way he's behaving with it. And so one by one, he asked, the Imam asked his companions and servants to give water to every single one of the soldiers of Al-Hur and their horses. The final of these men, when he came to drink, he was, he was having trouble. And he was so thirsty and so tired, the Imam Alaihi, peace be upon him, himself took the water and gave to this man to drink. And then the Imam, look at the compassion, the actions of the Imam. He takes water and gives it to the horse of this man. So look at, his, look at his, his generosity that the Imam in his own blessed hands, these were people that are supposed to attack him or kill him or prevent him. The Imam is behaving with them in such a way. Hur knew the status of Imam Hussein because what transpired then and there was that when Imam Hussein began to move his forces towards, proceed towards Kufa, he uh, tried to stop him and saying that they will kill you if you go there. And Imam Hussain Salam says that you, death, death is closer to you than you realize. He then put his hand on the reins of Imam Hussain's horse to restrain it from going there. At which point Imam Hussain Salam says, may your mother weep for you. And Hur says that no man no other man could have got away from me by saying that. But you occupy such a status, and so does your mother, that I dare not say it. It was noontime. It was time for the Dhuhr prayers. The Adhan was raised. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The Imam said to Al-Hur, you have your men, I have my people. You lead the prayer for your men, and I will lead the prayer for my companions. Al-Hur said, no, you are the grandson of Rasulullah. You are a companion of the Prophet. We will all pray behind you. And so thus, Imam Hussein alayhi salam led the salat both for his companions and also for the army of Al-Hur al-Riyahi. And so once the prayer was finished, Al-Hur confronted the Imam. He said to him, what, what are you here for? And the Imam said to him, I am here because I have an obligation. I was asked to be here. The people of Kufa sent for me. Al-Hur said, I have no knowledge of this. The Imam produced letters in the thousands. Al-Hur was surprised. He said, I have no knowledge of this. At the end, my mission is to prevent you from entering Kufa. This I must do. I cannot let you go into Kufa. Imam Hussein said, are you trying to threaten me with death? Let me tell you what one of the companions said when he went out to support Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I shall continue. There is no shame if a man to his death travels, if he truly as a Muslim struggles. If I live, I shall not regret nor be shamed. If I die, not be blamed. For in the acceptance of oppression, man is truly humiliated and shamed. When Al-Hur heard this, he stayed away from Imam Hussein. And thus Imam Hussein salam, and his companions rode on one side, Al-Hur and his army on the other side, and they changed course and headed for Karbala.